Don't die. Don't get wrecked. Don't lose everything. Your savings would be converted into Bitcoin. The relationship between states and individuals will change. From Why Bitcoin? Why does Bitcoin uh, matter to you? Why are you in the space? Uh, not even buying it, but also building in the space. That's a great question. So I, I think there are, I can, I can point to a couple of moments or, or milestones or times. Uh, I wouldn't say there's just one for me that was, you know, maybe a single catalyst for, for Bitcoin. Um, you know, there was a time that I first bought Bitcoin, but that's different to, you know, the time when I got Bitcoin or the time that I really went down or the times that I was really going down the rabbit hole. And then there's the time that I just decided to do it professionally in a sense too. I suppose starting with when I really got it, that for me, like many others was in 2020. Everyone remembers 2020 and all this crazy stuff that was going on there. And, you know, I think for me, there was a series of, confrontations with this fact that um, the the world was at least my corner of it at the time being in the United States and having in Australia it was run by really governments of people that weren't representing the people that they purported to and were making a, a number of decisions that Not only did I kind of disagree with it at the time, you know, things about lockdowns and responses to COVID and printing lots of money and all this kind of stuff. Not only were these were decisions that I thought were bad decisions, but that there seemed to be um, very little recourse uh, democratically to solve these problems. And also the more that I, the more time that I spent thinking about them, the more realizing that these were kind of deeply ingrained structural long-term problems with how, um, these governmental institutions have been allowed to develop and decline. And so while this was all happening, obviously <laughs> um, there was a Bitcoin bull market going on too. And, and so kind of coincided nicely with me just tumbling down the rabbit hole, not only learning about Bitcoin, but also seeing it really as, you know, I mentioned before, um, lack of recourse to problems that I saw in the world, seeing it really as potentially that, as being the thing that, um, was a way to counteract a lot of the negative forces that I saw uh, going on in the world. So that's, I guess, high level of, of kind of like why, why Bitcoin and, and where I started to get really inspired by it. Um, you know, at the time I was um, working in tech, um, working at uh, a venture capital firm, a fairly well-known one in Silicon Valley. And... And had been in tech for several years, and so I was kind of familiar with, I guess, the process of, of starting tech companies or who had done it, um, and was kind of in this milieu of, of Silicon Valley startups. And so then a couple of things happened to me over the course of that year of 2020 and, and then 2021 was realizing not only is Bitcoin, the kind of the importance of Bitcoin, and not only think, realizing how important Bitcoin was um, at a macro level, but also deciding that I wanted to commit myself to it professionally, full-time, maybe for a lifetime as well. So, so decided that uh, that's what I wanted to do in, in a general sense. Um, and then from there, it was um, somewhat easier to just think about, well, well, how can I contribute? What types of problems could I solve? Um, and, and, and all of that led me to eventually um, quitting my job and, and starting a company. So this is when you started the company with your brother, uh, Thomas, uh, called Hey Apollo. Yeah. Uh, so started Apollo with my brother, Thomas, um, and our other co-founder, Sahil, at uh, early, early last year um, in 2022. Um, and yeah, we, we started uh, the company, well, really because we, I guess, going to back what I was describing about the process of deciding that we wanted to do this. Uh, is, is asking some really basic questions like what um, how can we help bitcoin how can we help bitcoin adoption specifically and um many different ways uh, i suppose that you could do that but the one that we landed on was helping people to helping to onboard people 
to, to the Bitcoin ecosystem and network, specifically helping people to uh, find out which products to use, to compare Bitcoin products and services, um, uh, to find out what to trust and why, um, and, and <clears throat> in that way, help people get onboarded to the network. So Apollo is a platform where you can see reviews from uh, Bitcoin products and services. Can you also buy Bitcoin directly in the platform? No, we're not an, we're not an exchange. Um, okay. It really is just focused on, on the products. So um, exchanges for sure, uh, hardware wallets, nodes, um, all different kinds of products and, and financial services too. Um, really, it's a place for people to discover them, to compare them, to read about the experiences that, that other Bitcoiners have had with them and then uh, figure out what's right for them. Hmm, interesting. Is it just Bitcoin products or is it uh, in the long term planned with uh, other products too? Uh, it's outside of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah, like that, I, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, so it's, it's Bitcoin products today, you know, but of course the vision that we have not only for I suppose the world of Bitcoin products, but also Bitcoin more generally, is that Bitcoin is really going to eat up and subsume so many other adjacent product and service categories, which will, over time, perhaps in the not too distant future, will become Bitcoin categories themselves. So, by way of example, you know, you can already see this somewhat, but you know, in five years' time, there will be Bitcoin life insurance products, there will be Bitcoin mortgages, there will be Bitcoin, um, all different kinds of credit products related to Bitcoin. So really what we see this is uh, Bitcoin products and services is a, is a niche today, um, but eventually all Bitcoin, all companies will be Bitcoin companies um, and everybody will have a Bitcoin offering or a Bitcoin related offering. Um, and so Bitcoin, because it's going to become and is becoming money um, it's a kind of thin end of the wedge into as i say not just what look like bitcoin products today being you know wallets and exchanges but eventually um, many many other things too this brings me to your uh, ex profile at the moment i saw that you call yourself a bitcoin accelerationist and is building a company uh, and doing um more than just buying, meaning that you're a Bitcoin accelerist, uh, accelerist, or is what is the meaning of of that, and why are you calling yourself that? It's a good question. So, um, you know, this is something that I've been thinking about recently and and developing some thoughts on, and I wouldn't say that I have a final answer, honestly, but um, there is an ongoing discussion right now. Um, not so much in the Bitcoin world, more in the tech world about uh, what it means to uh, this is kind of meme war really going on between people calling themselves accelerationists and, and, and kind of casting their opponents as decelerationists. Uh, and particularly you see this in the world of AI. You know, on the one hand, you have a bunch of people who want to uh, or who have, I suppose, concerns or cautions or fears about the development of artificial intelligence um, and who maybe want to slow it down. And then in the other camp, you have um, your accelerators. Uh, and there's this kind of movement called, you know, I don't know, you might, you might be familiar with it, called effective accelerationism. And you basically, you've got a bunch of AI people who are kind of mimetically joining forces and, and are proponents of just going really fast um, and building really fast in the realm of AI. In addition to that, there have been some kind of interesting offshoots or, or forks of some of those ideas into, I guess, other domains and other fields too. Um, and, and Bitcoin is one of them. And I think, you know, so what does it mean to be an accelerationist with respect to Bitcoin? It's a, it's a, it's a long, complicated um, question, I guess. My early thoughts on it are, that it's a useful frame to tease apart some important, perhaps under-discussed issues in Bitcoin. Um, and in particular, the, you know, how people see the either natural or inevitable or probable course of Bitcoin adoption going. 
I guess to be more specific, you know, there's one, let's say broadly defined, there's like an accelerated maximum, like maximal speed version of Bitcoin adoption where we just say like Bitcoin, more Bitcoin usage full stop is good for Bitcoin. We want more people using Bitcoin in whatever way they want to. And let's just get as many people to join the network as fast as they can in any capacity. <clears throat> And this is this might sound like a bit of a straw man, and I'm not necessarily saying that people hold these specific views, but like this is just one way that you could, I guess, divide the world. So that's maybe an accelerationist point of view. And on the other hand, yeah. So, so yeah. Well, how does that sound? You tell me. Uh, it sounds great. Uh, the the one question that just came up in in my head is like, there is always a debate going on if hodling and uh, just spending the fiat and uh, the fiat that is overlapping in your income, just getting that into Bitcoin and but spending the the fiat or is spend and replace? Like, do you have to fire up the Bitcoin circular economy um, or is just hodling on the, the best place? It's... For me, it's an interesting question because uh, in some countries you have to deal with taxes. If you spend uh, Bitcoin, you have to deal with a lot of uh, other stuff. And how do you see that in accelerating the Bitcoin adoption? <clears throat> Can we have an accelerate Bitcoin adoption if most just hold them? Is holding Bitcoin using them? That's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure that... It, you know, immediately does it does it neatly fall along accelerationist lines? I'm not sure. I mean, I can certainly see the argument that the more the more circular economy type activity that there is, I suppose it's um, maybe furthering proofs of concept of what a hyper Bitcoinized future could look like. And so in that sense, maybe it is, it is a bit of a, you know, a vision of an accelerated future, but I suppose, you know, perhaps equally, I, I would say that just buying and spending Bitcoin, it's not clear to me what the actual spending of it, or even if it's been, you know, spending and replaces, it's not clear to me what that necessarily adds in a macro big picture sense to Bitcoin adoption, right? You have a whole bunch of pockets of circular economies and that's wonderful and perhaps wonderful for the people in them. Um, but if they are isolated, uh, even if they're well-functioning ones, that's perhaps somewhat different from, as I said, like big picture uh, progress of Bitcoin. I'm not sure. I mean, it it goes also back to the, the stages of money. We know that we are not just like you cannot just create money and be immediately unit of account, unit of exchange. The first money has to, um, in my opinion, prove itself as a store of value. And if it's then a store of value and people trust it and people believe in the value, uh, then it can slowly uh, start as a medium of exchange because people are having it and they want to exchange it because so many people have it. And then when all the people are exchanging it, then it slowly gets a unit of account. And I, I still, I, I just think we are now in the store of value phase uh, because uh, yeah. it's just like a so I, no, such I, early. I, yeah, people. I very much agree. You know, I think I think this is perhaps more of a question of what what is the definition, or what is a definition of success for Bitcoin. Um, how many different properties of money does it have to be fulfilling for, I suppose, the mission of Bitcoin to be achieved? You know, if, if it's never anything more than a store of value, you know, like a digital gold, well, this is a question, but would that be a success or would it be a failure? Or, or does Bitcoin have to be a medium of exchange? You know, I think if you ask, perhaps if you ask Michael Saylor, I think he would perhaps say something, I'll to put words in his mouth, but the sailor point of view, I think, would be that Bitcoin is is property, um, and you know, it's the best property in the world. It's the best store of value in the world, and and it, and we don't have to have it scale as a medium uh, exchange for eight billion people for it to succeed. On the other hand, <laughs> if you were to ask uh, uh, the Bitcoin Cash crowd, or um, uh, you know, other people like them, they would say, no, um, Bitcoin is supposed to be peer-to-peer -peer cash. 
and if, and if it's not that, then it's failed. Um, so yeah, so this this I guess is 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 kind of a, gets to the heart of of what Bitcoin is supposed to do and um, what is the mission of Bitcoin if there is one. When you look at let's say the year 2050, and you would now say, oh, this has to happen for Bitcoin in order that I say in 2050, oh, it was a success. Like what what metrics has Bitcoin to hit? What like what has to happen in 2050 for you to say when you are then in 2050, oh, Bitcoin actually was a success over the last, let's say, 25 years. Uh, in your opinion, how does that look like? I think I agree with you about the stages of money and that's, that, that perhaps store of value precedes the medium of exchange. And so thinking along those lines, I would say um, there are certain milestones that we would want to see Bitcoin hit, perhaps in a certain order. So becoming the preeminent global store of monetary value would be one of them, really overtake and replace gold, for example. Uh, that would be a surprise to me, but I think it would be something with, you know, I would expect that to happen soon. So, so that would be one. I think, you know, Okay, so what's the, the current market cap of gold? Um, if Bitcoin reached it, I think that would imply a price of around 700K. Now, obviously, that doesn't take into account a lot of that monetary energy actually trend. Um, I don't know, price targets are hard, but certainly north of a million dollars a coin. Um, but, but yeah, aside from just the number, I would say, you, you know, what, what role is it playing in society? Replacing gold would be one. And there are many other stores of value too that, I think many people in Bitcoin would agree the the monetary energy energy of which should go to Bitcoin. But so you see, be... but but you are seeing fiat still be around in twenty fifty. I th I think so. Yeah, uh, I do. Predictions are hard, but yes. I, I I don't think twenty fifty is not that far away. Really, you know, twenty fifty is about as far away as as the year two thousand is from today. And um, it's it's very very hard to imagine everything, you know, fiat based monetary financial systems being wholesale replaced by by Bitcoin. That's even if Bitcoin is capable as a network with different layers of of handling the applications that the fiat financial system performs today, which I'm not sure if it can. But even if it could, I think, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure. Like, that would be so radical and so crazy. So I, say, I wouldn't say that it's a failure condition of Bitcoin if fiat, fiat economies still exist in 50 years now, or 25 years. Now, do I think that they will be the fiat currencies that exist today? Probably not. <laughs> um, many of them will die and probably die within the next 10 years. But... You know, fiat currencies aren't hard to create. So, so uh, fiat in general, as a thing, as a as a phenomenon, will still exist. Individual fiat currencies will almost certainly die. Interesting. So, in this, uh, so for you, uh, it's more about the store of value, and you have more questions about uh, the medium of exchange still. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose my, my questions about media of exchange are on two levels. One yeah. is, one is, um, as I said, the, the, there's a question, there's a technical question of is Bitcoin technically capable of scaling to 8 billion people as a medium of exchange or even a meaningful subset of them, which today I think the answer is no. I think that's fairly uncontroversial. But then the secondary, the secondary question is, you know, does it have to? Is that necessary for Bitcoin to, to succeed in some sense? So what does succeed mean? Again, there are different definitions, but, you know, if Bitcoin can act as a, um, a real disciplinary constraint on the excesses of fiat, even if it isn't, you know, a global medium of exchange, would we say that Bitcoin succeeds under those circumstances? I'm not, I'm not sure, but, but maybe. 
Interesting. Um, this maybe gets also in a, a different topic of mine. Can there be anything that stops Bitcoin at that moment? Like, is there any um, event or player or something that happens that can stop Bitcoin? I'm, I'm 100% sure that there is something that can um, slow down the adoption or accelerate the adoption. That's for sure. But is there anything still, in your opinion, that can stop Bitcoin at that moment? At the moment of, like, at some later date or today? Like, no, I guess, today, thinking about like, the world as it exists. Like, right now? Like, yeah. for me, in 2050, if we are the, if Bitcoin is the um, biggest and val most valuable asset, which it would be if it would take over gold, uh, because gold is right now the one, Uh, then for me in 2050, it's just not even possible. Like this, I think it's not uh, controversial to say in 2050, it's, it's not being stopped. It's just like keeps accumulating. Um, but we are in an earlier stage. Uh, I don't think there is anything, but I am always curious uh, what uh, other Bitcoiners have to say. And some have some concerns in some areas. Yeah, um, definitely. Definitely, Bitcoin can be can be stopped. I think uh, Bitcoin is not inevitable. Um, it's a useful mean to propagate on, on X and, and other platforms, but Bitcoin can be stopped for sure. And, you know, and my I guess particular focus is with Apollo directed at what I see as one of the big uh, vulnerabilities of Bitcoin, and it's a social one. You know, in my view, Bitcoin adoption is succeeding because people increasingly trust it. That's why people buy it and that's why people hold it. There are, you know, trust is uh, fragile and ephemeral and can be abused and can be broken. Um, and, and that is so with individual people, but it is also the case with new technologies that seek to replace incumbent technologies, particularly revolutionary ones, you know. My, um, you know, by way of, I suppose, historical analogy, you know, I like to think about nuclear power. You know, in, in much the same way that Bitcoin is, we would say, already the best monetary network in the world, perhaps it's already the best money in, in the world, certainly the best store of value. Nuclear power is, in many ways, the best, uh, best form of energy. Why is it the case that we aren't all, you know, that every, uh, every city in the world is running on nuclear power? Well, I mean, it's a somewhat rhetorical question, but my analysis of it is it's a trust problem, right? When was Chernobyl? Chernobyl, the Chernobyl disaster was like 1986 or something. What are we, it's like 40 years later. Yeah, you know, and, and it's true. You know, nuclear, nuclear power is the best power today. It was also true 40 years ago, right? But what happens is there's a massive, um, there's a massive trust breaking incident. And then the technology really has been in the wilderness for 40 years since, you know, you have people to this day who, in my view, wrongly, but they're very concerned about the dangers of nuclear power and so on and so forth. And so what does this have to do with Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a superior monetary asset and network today, but there's no reason I can see why it couldn't also spend 40 years in the wilderness if nobody trusts it. Network itself and, and, and more to do with harder to manage social events around us. You know, when I, um, <laughs> about a year ago, I was, uh, uh, I was talking to a family member or a distant family member about, um, about FTX of all things, you know, and this is someone who, you know, I'd met them at like a, a family Christmas event and they said to me, uh, you know, so what do you do? What are you working on? And I said, I'm working on Bitcoin. Um, and they said, oh yeah, Bitcoin, that's, um, that's that FTX thing, right? Bitcoin, <laughs> Sam Bankman fried you know, it's all kind of the same thing to them, you know, and that was, that was a, a fairly dispiriting uh, moment for me because I realized that like at the level of kind of, normie land, you know, millions of people in America and around the world, 
that was probably also the case for them, right? Bitcoin equals FTX equals Sam Bankman Fried. And I was wondering, you know, and I, and I immediately thought, well, like, how long is it going to take? How long is it going to take to regain that level of, regain the trust, you know, kind of climb out of that hole? Um, and not only that, but how many shots do we have at that, really? Like, what if there's another FTX? What if there are two more FTXs, right? Like, would people just kind of write Bitcoin off, at least for a significant amount of time, in significant numbers? So, so that's my biggest concern, I would say, with Bitcoin, is that we need to get everyday people to, uh, to trust this, to adopt this, and to not, you know, we can't run the risk again, really, of letting there be another FTX that just is like the Chernobyl moment for Bitcoin. I mean, for me, it all comes back to education. And I also think that that's the, the reason why Bitcoin adoption is not like <laughs> a lot of Bitcoin has say that. And I also have the experience once I got it, I was having a lot of FOMO because I thought, oh, I'm not that intelligent. Uh, other people will also figure it out that this is the, as you said, the best monetary system we have. So it will just adopt tomorrow at 100%. But it is not like that because uh, although we have a digital global globalized world, our brains did not got an upgrade and we still need a lot of time to process things. And we need time to make the change. I heard Bitcoin first time in 2017 uh and bought it first in 2020 like i needed three years and i and i was really 100 convinced and i discussed it with other people that bitcoin is shit in 2020 i discovered that bitcoin uh, uh is not shit and the, the interesting part is um i ran out of arguments against other people that talked me talked about with me uh, on the topic of Bitcoin. And then I was like, okay, this weekend I will sit down and say to myself, I will uh, openly uh, search for Bitcoin reasons to fail. And, <laughs> and in that search on that weekend, I discovered that Bitcoin is actually not that bad. Uh, <laughs> and for me, it all comes down for education because also, as you said, FDX, if you're really educated, you know FTX is a company and has uh, not directly a connection to Bitcoin. Of course, in the like, of course, they are dealing with Bitcoin. They are dealing with other cryptos also. They are exchange, um, so there is a connection obviously to Bitcoin, uh, but it has nothing to do with the Bitcoin protocol itself. It has to do with like a small thing in the whole ecosystem. But other people that uh, didn't do the homework in education wise that they're just uh, living their life and not bothering with uh, a deep deep understanding of bitcoin they don't see it that way and that's understandable that they don't see it that way uh, but it all comes down to trust and trust is gained if you spend time with it and uh, uh, spend a lot of education on it and i think number go up technology is bringing them back in all the time uh, but yeah, it, it's it's the, it's the one thing that money needs, trust. And you're completely right. If Bitcoin fails to have trust of a global scale, it will fail completely. And yeah. in order like this, uh, to put it in a question, um, for a normal pleb, uh, for a normal person that uh, is just having Bitcoin right now and is... Is, is like loves the technology and is completely into the Bitcoin adoption. And what can they do to increase that adoption and avoid an FTX? Because like there will be companies built and they will fail eventually. Uh, in the Bitcoin sphere, we have the first one with Mount Gox and now we have FTX, we have Celsius. And I think there will be at least five more cases or 10 maybe 100 cases i don't know uh let's see how big the scale of them are because the sec and so on uh, cracks them down but what can a normal blab do to increase the adoption and increase the trust in bitcoin many things but 
immediately what I think is most important is protecting against the biggest risks, right? Like don't die, don't get wrecked, don't lose everything, you know? Um, if you onboard someone to Bitcoin and you convince them to buy at the top of a cycle and then the price goes down, then yeah, their trust is going to be harmed, but at least they'll have their coins, right? Um, they'll still have their sats. And so perhaps the trust is recoverable. But if someone gets rugged, you know, if someone loses their savings, if someone gets scammed, stolen from, lied to, cheated, then that's the that's the real big risk. So I would say what can people do is at least make sure that when you are orange peeling, onboarding, shilling whatever products and services uh, you you want to, um, minimize that risk for people, for, for your family and friends. Um, you, you know, send them to the right, the right trustworthy exchanges, get them to use the best custody services and providers. Um, don't obviously over promise, right? Uh, don't tell someone, uh, don't tell your, your uncle that he's going to uh, retire in two months time um, and get super rich overnight. Um, but most importantly, don't, you know, just make sure that nobody gets taken down a really bad path of um, getting wrecked and, and winding up in the hands of, of, of scammers and thieves. That would be my biggest piece of advice. And you and your brother and who was the other, uh, the third one founded? The third, Sahil, yeah. Sahil. Um, you founded the company on a Bitcoin only standard. Basically, like you focused solely on Bitcoin, is it right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you discover Bitcoin only? Like, how did you had some uh, altcoin shitcoins, as as we <laughs> we call them? Uh, did you consider making that platform open for other cryptos? Why hyper focusing on Bitcoin? Why does this make sense for you? We never considered it for the company. No. Um, you know, well, so, so there's, there's a, I guess there's one question, which is what does it mean to be Bitcoin only, particularly in our context, you know, and it's, it, it isn't necessarily black and white because, you know, we are an index, I suppose, of um, products and services that companies have Bitcoin products and services. So there are companies that have a Bitcoin product that also have altcoin products. Coinbase, for example. So Coinbase is listed on Apollo and people can review it and learn about it. Um, but for us, the relevant dis the distinction to make is um, is the Bitcoin part. So if you, if you have a Bitcoin offering and you're not, obviously, um, like that's there are other qualifying factors too, but that's how we make the distinction. If you don't have any Bitcoin offering, then you're just not relevant for Apollo. So that that's kind of how we think about Bitcoin versus other stuff. Um, why not include other cryptocurrencies? Well, I mean, it's much the same. It's not purely ideological. Right? It's not because we're just laser eyed Nazis, but it's because when you build it, you know, when you're building a company, you're trying to build something that will stand the test of time. Uh, and the, the, I think the objective fact is that altcoins don't, you can, you can gamble on them. Sure but um, they don't stand the test of time. So if we think about what's going to be around in 10 years or longer, it's going to be Bitcoin. And so the choice really is obvious for us. Like why would we predicate our company on a bunch of junk that is, um, that's going to flame out within, you know, within one cycle? Uh, it just doesn't make sense. It all goes back to, to, to trust and uh, actual decentralization and uh thinking of is an altcoin even actually decentralized when for example at ethereum there can be a rollback of an, a transaction uh, that can basically a complete overhaul of the whole system from proof of work to proof of stake i don't know if uh, that's actually that decentralized and if if the use cases of a video game character is maybe better off in a centralized database <laughs> more effective <laughs> i don't know 
Uh, but let, let's yeah. see how it plays out. I, I'm just like, I'm, I did some uh, altcoins. I did Ethereum. I did uh, some really small shit coins also. Uh, but in 2021, uh, I was going all in only in Bitcoin. I was completely, uh, as you said, laser eyed maxi. <laughs> I was completely only in Bitcoin then. And uh, it, 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 it turned out really great so far. And I think uh, Bitcoin is uh, definitely uh, the the only winner, I think, in the long run in that game. But uh, let's see. Uh, the time will tell how, how, we'll, how we will uh, continue that way. And I have watched one uh, podcast of you and your brother discussing about the sovereign individual. And I would... Mm, I, I will not open that whole book now because it's <laughs> uh, a completely other topic. But what for you is it meaning to be a sovereign individual? Uh, and what does it mean to be a sovereign individual, maybe even outside of Bitcoin? Like, what is it meaning? Why do we need Bitcoin to be a sovereign individual? But also, what elements are outside of Bitcoin to be a sovereign individual? Yeah. So I think, I think you're right. We, we can't um, summarize the entire book here. Um, but maybe it's worth just discussing high level the themes, or so, some of them, the overarching yeah. themes. Um, and so I suppose from my point of view, how would I describe it? I would say The Sovereign Individual, for those of you who don't know, it was a book, uh, history book of sorts written in the mid to late 90s uh, by a couple of guys uh, who... The area of study is, is, I think, as they describe it, mega political trends, me like macro historical trends that occur on the scale of not uh, decades, but uh, hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. Um, and so the, the book is written with that frame in mind, and in particular, uh, I suppose, forecasting predicting or, or, or even describing that um, society then in the 90s and pretty much the same case now is on the cusp of one of these big mega political trends of kind of an, an epoch changing um, uh, paradigm shifting movement. Um, and that movement is, as they describe it, from the, the era or the world of nation states as they exist today, um, out of that. Um, and that certainly in the nineties, which was, I suppose, the, the, perhaps the, the Pico top, um, of nation state dominance, um, you have, you know, the United States was leader of the free world, many other Western nations where, where their, their dominance is, uh, so complete, not only over the, the world at large, but within their geographical boundaries, you have the state as such that is completely coterminous with the nation. Um, these governments that control every aspect of your life as a citizen. Um, there's no escape from taxation or regulation or, or anything like that, whether you like that or you don't. And so the book, what the book forecasts is um, a decline of these nation states for, for various reasons. Broadly, though, the reason is, was that we were on the, on the, um, on the verge of entering the information age. Right. The internet, particularly in 1996, um, was, was just growing and perhaps at a similar stage of adoption to what Bitcoin is today. And so these, they saw the internet as being this kind of great um, unraveling force of the power of nation states. And that increasingly, as people move out of the physical world and into the digital world, uh, they live more of their lives online and they kind of increasingly escape the reaches of, of nation states who, who persist quite explicitly as set out in the book through the uh through the exaction of violence or the threat of violence to um tax citizens and to kind of force their compliance to every type of law that they have so what is the, what is what is being a sovereign individual a sovereign individual as the book describes is somebody who is t undergoing this journey or transformation to a kind of from a citizen of a nation to a to a citizen to a citizen of the web, um, you're kind of an online citizen um, who you know not only can you kind of um, project yourself digitally and connect with other people, 
through the internet, but as which interestingly kind of forecast in the book that perhaps your wealth, your savings would be converted into digital currencies. This is a prediction of theirs in 1996, um, kind of presciently anticipating Bitcoin. Anyway, all, what does all this mean? I suppose. Um, so a sovereign individual is, um, I believe that we are seeing people today who are more and more living the lives of, they're either living the lives of sovereign individuals or they are attempting to, or perhaps they are realizing that that is a path for them. It's a viable path. You know, taxation, exploitation, I think is becoming more and more onerous, particularly for the more most productive members of Western societies. You know, I live in California uh, and, uh, you know, it's, I think something like 20% of the people in California pay like an astoundingly high proportion of all the, you know, in, of tax revenues of the state here. And I think that disproportionate representation is only going to be exacerbated going forward. Um, and so, you know, taxes are going to go up if you've got a lot of money. And, and that's why people are fleeing the state. Anyway, not to get sidetracked on California, but um, so sovereign individualism is, is people who I would say are coming to this realization that nation states are declining and that there are um, perhaps alternate paths for people to pursue to expand their own sovereignty in, in ways that, that they weren't raised to believe were possible or, or existed. So this will, when we spin this uh, far more in the future with Bitcoin as an, a fundamental layer for money uh, with the internet, with in, uh, con uh, communication that cannot be stopped and people are living more and more in the in the web, as you said, uh, and then can, you can work from everywhere, like home office and stuff like that. Um, how will this change the political situation when governments basically have to, con like has to compete with one another that they, citizens live in their boundaries and have to basically have to have an attractive place for people to stay. How will this change the whole political game in the, let, let's say, next 20 years for you? Yeah. Well, I think in the language of the sovereign individual book, they would say that the relationship between states and individuals will change from one of a kind of, um, you know, master-servant relationship to a kind of uh, client relationship where states actually have to, as you say, compete to serve their constituents and their citizens. You know, if it's, if, if let's say it's trivially easy for you to acquire two or three more passports right, from other kind of startup or forward thinking nations who want you to go and live and work there because you are a productive person, and if it's also trivially easy for you to take your wealth with you because it's in an unconfiscatable form, i.e. Bitcoin, then what's going to happen? You know, I, I don't know where you live, but what, you know, where do you live? Uh, let's say you live, for example's sake, in the United States. Well, what choice does your government have other than to make it more attractive for you to try and, well, there are two ways, I suppose. You, they can either increase the incentives to stay or they can increase the disincentives to leave. So that's, I guess that's how you could think about your, your, your country of origin, right? Um, dis, what does a disincentive to leave looks like? Well, we, already, we actually already have that in the United States. Like there is an exit tax. If you want to leave the United States um, and go somewhere else, you are still subject to the taxation regime of the United States. And if you really want to exit, there's like a straightforward tax on all of your wealth above a certain threshold. I think it's like $2 million. So, um, so this disincentive is if you try and leave, we will take your money. Now, Bitcoin makes that harder, but, um, you know, 
I still wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of the United States government if it came to that. Of course, you can also, you, you know, that's the kind of stick. There's also the carrot, right? What does a carrot look like? It looks like, hey, we'll lower your taxes. We will give you freedoms that you don't have today, but maybe you would like to have. Um, and that's, I guess, country of origin. Now on the country of destination, um, I think we're already seeing lots of interesting things happen there. You know, El Salvador is uh, you know, in the process of developing new regimes to, to attract tech talent, people in general, um, opening up their kind of passport for a certain amount of investment. Uh, I think today in El Salvador, it's like a million bucks. Um, but, you know, my prediction is it's going to be a lot less than that in 10 years time. You know, and why do I say that? Because today there's one El Salvador. In 10 years time, there will be 30 El Salvadors, right? And they will all be doing the same thing. They will be competing for the best, wealthiest, most productive, most pro-social talent on earth who will be able to pack up and leave and take their wealth and families with them. And so you're going to see, I suppose, a great increase in the competition. And these, these kind of, there's going to be a market basically for citizens. In other words, it's going to be a, um, right now you have a, a, a seller's market, that, right? Put it in like real estate terms. You have a seller of government services and it's really a seller's market. There's nothing you can do more or less. Like for most people in the world, you, you take whatever, you know, you have a monopolist on your doorstep. There's nothing you can do. But the world is moving to a buyer's market, buyers of government services, right? You're going to have many to choose from, many places to go. Um, and the balance of power is going to shift dramatically. A kind of beautiful future if, um, if we are thinking about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there's, there's one more thing I would like to ask you. I also heard it on a podcast of yours. Um, you are we were talking about a uh, future post ads and this is something I hear more and more in the Bitcoin sphere about value for value. Like you provide uh, some value. Uh, for example, I have this podcast and people can via fountain or via any other uh, app uh, stream Satoshis to me or just send Satoshis to me. And this is a uh, quite amazing or even X uh, tries to do that with, uh, you have to pay the, for Twitter blue and, uh, or YouTube premium is also that like you pay for YouTube premium and the uh, content creators that are monetized getting a certain amount of that. It's, it's, it's in the fiat world, but it's based on the same principle. I would say, um, why do you think we have a post ad error? Like, do you think that there will not be any? paid advertisement or will it look different? Like what's your take on value for value and the post ad future? Well, I'm certainly not an expert on this stuff. And as much as I do, I, I think value for value is very interesting. And, and certainly on an individual level, you know, I have many content creators who are, who are making it work. I'm not totally convinced that value for value as it is thought of and as it exists today could really replace advertising as such. The thing about ads is people don't like them, but they work, they actually work really well, you know, and, and in some specific ways, like there's very little friction, you know, if they're, if they're placed well, you know, you don't have to make any decisions as as a um as like a consumer of content um there's no kind of switching costs between different experiences you know a, a well placed and a well crafted ad I, I think there'll always be a place for that online because there are yeah the, the the idea you know there have been many examples of people trying to rethink paywalls for example, paywalls for news sites and articles, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying it can't work, but they, but they really haven't worked so far. And it's because it's, it's actually tough. It's tough to, to make this kind of decision of like, do I want to pay a certain amount for something ahead of time when I don't know what it is? Um, so that's kind of an unsolved problem. Now, as for, I guess, more, maybe more traditional value for value, which is paying after the fact, 
it's a novel idea, right? That you're going to consume something, have an experience, and then decide how much to contribute on a voluntary basis for it. Um, and like I said, I think individuals can and have pulled it off, but does it does it scale? I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, so cautiously optimistic about innovation, but not sure um, if anyone's really cracked it yet. Yeah, it's it's a difficult because also when you think about a consumer, um, he goes on a website, wants to consume something like an article or podcast or videos, whatever it is, and if they get just an ad by the side or the the podcast uh, podcaster is just reading an ad in the middle, like in the like after 20 minutes, like one minute ad, uh, it's, it's easy. Like you listen yeah. to it, maybe you can skip it. Uh, but if you have to pay for an episode before or, uh, after you consumed it, uh, you have, you, 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 you want, you, you want to pay for it because it was so great. Uh, that's difficult. Like <laughs> having, having such an economy. Um, but if it works, it would be, tremendously amazing uh, i also don't see it work right now um i see uh, ad revenue just being so much of a greater income source for most people than they can ever make for value for value yeah. um for me it's now difficult to say because i don't make money either way <laughs> like i have no ad ad sense anywhere i don't i'm not monetized on x um, I mean, I have a lightning wallet and they're, they're coming such in, but it's uh, for dollar terms, really, really small amount. And um, I, I would like, I am really curious about it. So I, when I saw and hear you talking about it, it was interesting to me. And yeah. we having an end routine on that podcast where the previous guest asked a question for the next guest. I stole that idea from uh, the, the diary of a CEO and I just loved that idea and was okay. like, I, I will just quickly steal that idea just because I just <laughs> love it so much. <laughs> and, Great. and the previous guest asked a question and it's actually not Bitcoin related. Uh, if you were in charge of the education system, how would you change it or redesign it? And would you add any subjects or would you get rid of any subjects? How would you see the education system there? I love this question. I love the format too. So I'll, so I'll make a general point, which I think many people would agree with, is that massive reform is necessary for um, Edu Western education systems, both, you know, at the, at the high school and younger level and also tertiary education. I think current systems are unsustainable and failing. And so I have some thoughts and ideas about what could be done. Now, I'll preface this <laughs> by also saying that I don't have any children yet. And I know people who do. I know that it's easier to uh, talk about the problems and easier to speculate about possible solutions than it is in practice to execute on them particularly when you have uh, children and you are um, just trying to do the best thing you can um, in perhaps you know, not a super risky way for your kids. Having said all that, something that I find really interesting about education, particularly education trends over the past few years, is that you know, if you look at the rates of homeschooling, basically since COVID 2020, Homes, the homeschool numbers has like gone absolutely like parabolic. Like it's like, you know, Bitcoin price level growth of the number of people being homeschooled. Um, you know, and partly that's because people had to stay out of school for a while, but I think it's, it's deeper than that, which is there is an increasing recognition that um, schooling systems uh, in many ways suck. So what am I, I can't remember what the question was, it like what am I excited about or what do I predict or what do I think needs to happen? I guess a combination of all of those things is, um, I would say, technology-based solutions that allow students to get individualized, customized support. Um, and I already see some like really cool examples of, of companies being built producing products that do this. But I think, uh, you know, I, I fundamentally, fundamentally believe that the best form of education is like a, a kind of tutor-pupil relationship one-on-one, -on -one. Um, you know, it's the most Lindy form of education. 
Um, it's just the best way to do it. Now, it doesn't scale in, you know, in, in mass democracies, we have these kind of factory farm public education systems because particularly these days, you know, you need two parents going to work and, and you need childcare and all this other stuff. But all of that aside, the kind of one-to-one -one, um, tutoring is, I think, um, not in the best form of education, but that's where the most exciting developments are. And particularly AI, um, AI based models, like there's a company called the Synthesis School, it's building some really cool things here. So um, yeah, I'm excited about, uh, uh, about big changes in education. That's what AI is really uh, interesting. I uh, have an Indian girlfriend and I try to learn Hindi. Uh, it's 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 a really difficult language. I, I don't try to learn the the the, uh, the signs. I'm staying in our sign language, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I programmed myself a GPT that learns me Hindi, and it's actually quite good. Like there are a lot of apps out there, like Duolingo and other mm -hmm. apps like that, that do a, an amazing job in learning you and and language. Um, but it's actually uh, really easy to just program yourself in GPT. Then uh, you're saying, hey, I, I'm at this level, I want to learn uh, this kind of language, or I want, like, I, I'm sure it works with math. I'm sure it, it works with yep. everything. And it's quite good because you can ch always change it up. If you're like, oh, I don't like those kinds of sorts, uh, then you can ask it, hey, please, those exercises I don't like. Uh, make it more fun for that uh, or I'm kind of stuck at that, that language level how can I accelerate because it has all the information uh, it's an, it's an interesting like AI brings an interesting perspective into the the whole schooling system I think yeah yeah that's it's incredible you know it's like the most famous example I can think of is like uh, you know Alexander the Great was personally tutored and educated by Aristotle, I think. I completely got that wrong. But anyway, so the idea is the idea here is like, obviously in the modern world up until today, such a thing at scale for everybody is like a you know impossible notion. But with AI, you know, this this is the vision, right? With AI, is that every student in the world has their own Aristotle educating them from cradle to adulthood. So it's an incredibly revolutionary idea i think yeah that's great uh that's really great um a good point where we can end it up now where can people find you where can you where do you want to lead them uh, uh what what is the ways to get in contact with you yeah uh two two places to go one if you're interested in apollo um and and what apollo does um helping people to compare and find bitcoin products and services just go to heyapollo.com, H-E-Y-A-P-O-L-L-O.com. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me or follow along with me, I'm, I'm on X, um, Julian, double underscore Farah. Um, maybe in, in post-production, you can throw that up there. I can spell it out for them now. Um, but yeah, those will be the two spots. Um, the, uh, check out Apollo and, and uh, track me down on X. Oh, great. Thank you for being on, Julian. Yeah, thanks, Robin. This is great.